Good morning, everyone. This is Josh with Jacksonville Eco Tour Adventures. Today, I'm here with Kyle Kissock of the Jacksonville Wildlife Foundation, and we're talking about wildlife friendlier fences. Uh, migrations are a big theme of spring in the, t in the Jackson Hole area. We have some of the longest known mammal migrations in the lo lower 48 states and in the world even going on right now um, all around us. Pronghorn antelope have entered the Jackson Hole Valley after traveling up to 150 miles from their wintering areas south of Jackson Hole. Mule deer travel through Jackson Hole um, on a migration that can be 250 miles. And along the way, these migrants are inevitably hitting barriers to their migrations and fencing are one of the, are one of the big ones. Uh, that's why, as part of our commitment to conservation, we partner with, Jack, with the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation to work on fence removal or fence modification project, projects to help wildlife move across the landscape more safely. So Kyle, before we talk about this fence, tell us a little bit about the work with the, of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation. Yeah, well, thank you, Josh. And first off, thanks for having me out in the field with you today. Um, EcoTours has been a great partner with the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation over the years. So our mission is to work to promote ways to make our community live more compatibly with wildlife. One of the programs that the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation has is our Wildlife Friendlier Fence Program. And that is where we go out and we'll make modifications or we'll do complete removals to fences that no longer serve a purpose to contain livestock like cattle or horses and are really just sitting there on the landscape impeding the movement of wildlife. Great. And, and why, like, so we're at this awesome location here. We've got um, the southern end of the Tetons in the background and uh, behind, uh, behind us to the, to the other, in the other direction is the, um, is the Jackson Hole Valley. So this is a really important area for wildlife and, and why is that? Yeah, that's a great question. So you have some rich habitat right here and um, during the fall, you have a lot of elk moving through this area. They're gonna be migrating to the valley, from the valley, to the mountains in the spring. So they're moving through this area a lot. Now, when people think of barriers to wildlife movement and migration, we think of roads, we think of houses and subdivisions, but we don't often think of fence. Fences. And so this is a fence um, that elk would come across during the migration. You would also have moose in this area, a lot of mule deer. So we're talking about a lot of the main ungulate species that you would find in the Jackson Hole area. Um, the problem with fences is that they can separate young animals from their, uh, their mothers and animals can actually also become entangled in fences. And um, as we like to say, the best fence is no fence. But if you have to have a fence, like I was mentioning earlier, to contain livestock, then there's actually modifications you can do to make your fence what we would call wildlife friendlier so that wildlife can pass through. This reduces the chance of them becoming entangled in the fence, and it reduces the chance of young animals becoming separated, like I said, from their mothers. And that's a pretty big deal for wildlife. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the number of animals that can be impacted by fences and killed by fences? Yeah, absolutely. So there was a study done in the early 2000s. It looked at about 600 miles of fence in Wyoming and in Western Colorado. And what it found was for every year, for every two miles of fence, one animal was found dead through direct entanglement in that fence. Generally speaking, that's barbed wire fence, okay? Now that, act, that number actually increases when you count young animals like fawns that were found dead near fences to one animal per mile per year, which is a lot when you think about um, the number of fence in the West. And I don't know what that number yeah. is, but it's tens of thousands of miles wow. of fence. Mm -hmm. If you're having an, basically an animal per mile per year die because of that fence, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So in some places like this working ranch, we have a need for fences, but that doesn't mean we don't that, that we can't modify the fences to make it easier for wildlife to, to pass through, especially during really important parts of the year. So do you wanna talk about what the foundation did with the landowner here to, to make this fence more wildlife friendly? Yeah, so this landowner is another one of our partners. They're very interested in wildlife conservation, but like you said, it's also a working ranch. They do have cattle. We just saw some uh, right across the road here. And so what we've done with this fence is our volunteers have essentially helped them make it more wildlife friendly by, by installing these drop down clips. Um, we've also put a smooth bottom wire on the fence. And what this does is it allows smaller animals, anything from a fox or a coyote, or maybe even a baby elk 
to move under the fence um, without getting caught on the wire. Mm -hmm. I do want to show you how this drop down works. Um, that's why we're standing by this fence. So I'm just going to come over here. And as you can see, we just have these little pins that are acting as staples. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop the wire down a level. And then drop it down even more. And the landowner will do this in the winter time or the fall and the spring, basically whenever they're not having cattle in the area. And that way those ungulates, the elk, like I talked about, that are migrating here from the mountains to the valley and vice versa, can come right through, they can step over the fence, and they're not going to get caught in that fence. So it's a really simple solution, uh, but it's a, it's a great fix um, in an area where maybe you're not running cattle year round. Yeah. It doesn't require a ton of work. You just did that really quickly. Yeah, it's pretty easy once you have the modification in place. <clears throat> Another thing that we would we would tell people is uh, there's a maximum height uh, for fences. And to make a fence wildlife friendly, it really shouldn't be over 42 inches tall. Mm -hmm. um, at 42 inches, you're still going to be able to uh, contain most livestock. But an animal like an elk or a deer is going to be able to clear that fence. Really easily, yeah. yeah. And then the, you, you mentioned the smooth rail on the bottom. And there's a distance at the on the bottom that allows animals like like pronghorn that don't really like to jump over fences to, to crawl under more easily and then also those those baby animals that we've been seeing a lot of around the jackson hole area lately um can can more easily crawl under the fences and join their their mothers that are easy that are able to jump over exactly so some of the most dangerous fences we see to wildlife are for instance like a sheet fence that goes all the way to the ground because nothing can get through that yeah so the minimum height um, with a wire fence like this or a wooden post and rail fence would be 16 to 18 inches you wouldn't really want to go lower than that if you can avoid it um, because that's going to prevent animals from getting under the fence um, so it's 16 to 18 at the bottom, 42 to 40 inches high. Um, if you build your fence within those parameters, animals are generally going to be able to get through that fence and it's not going to serve as a barrier. A last thing I'll say too is that the vast majority of animals that do get caught actually entangled in fences, they're getting caught because the fence is loose. So the wire is just kind of hanging there or they're getting caught because the two top wires and the fence are really close together. So if you can keep your wires tight as a landowner um, and if you can keep the spacing between the top wire and the second wire at at least a foot, um, you're going to reduce your chances of catching an animal in the fence unintentionally. Awesome. Well, uh, we're going to go check out some other fences here and uh, learn about those. So thanks for the information on this one. And let's, uh, let's see what else we can get into. Sounds good. So this is an example of a fence where we could probably make some improvements. Um, just like the last fence we looked at, it does have the drop wire system installed, which is fantastic. So there's a pain here. Um, but the problem with it in this area is it's come unattached from the T-post. And this is what I mean when I talk about those top two wires being really problematic in terms of potentially entangling wildlife. If an elk tries to jump over this, these wires are really loose and it can get caught up in those top two bars. So this is a fence where um, it's good that it has the drop pens, but what we probably want to do is make sure these wires are a little bit tighter. This T-post is in place uh, to make it completely wildlife friendly. We're at another site. Um, this one's pretty interesting because it has both uh, like a wildlife unfriendly barbed wire fence and then also like the remains of a buck rail fence. And this is one of the project sites that EcoTour Ventures is actually going to work on uh, with the Wildlife Foundation. And uh, we're going to remove this buck rail fence and then eventually the landowner is going to fix up that, that barbed wire fence so that it's more wildlife friendly. So Kyle's going to kind of give us a little walking tour and show us um, what exactly that's going to look like. So what EcoTour Adventures is going to help us do um, with their volunteers is they're going to come in and they're going to be responsible for removing this old falling apart buck and rail fence. So as you can see right now, this buck and rail fence is right up against the wire fence, which is the active fence that is used to contain livestock on the property that we're next to. And why this is important is because the way this fence is situated, an animal could potentially jump one fence only to hang itself up in the other fence. So the landowner wants to come in, remove the, the buck and rail, which is serving no purpose, and Eco Tours Adventures is really going to be helpful in, uh, in getting this out. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is 
what this landowner is going to do is not only remove the buck and rail, but looking at this fence and thinking back to what we talked about at our previous stock, there's actually some modifications they can do to make the barbed wire fence more wildlife friendly, and they do plan to do that. So what we're going to see here is the smooth top rail, and what they're planning on doing is extending the top rail, so um, it runs along here and continues along the rest of the fence. And uh, that top rail is going to be really nice if an animal, a uh, picture an elk, moving through this area, um, they're going to be able to jump right over that. Again, as long as it's at this height, which isn't higher than 42 inches, um, they're going to be able to jump over this and they're not going to get caught up in the wire. So it's a really nice project um, for, for wildlife um, and it's going to make this whole area a lot more permeable and let elk and moose move through a lot easier. And uh, what other things might um, a landowner with, like with this fence um, do to make it even more wildlife friendly if they wanted to? Right, so assuming the buck rail is coming completely out because that doesn't serve any purpose right now, it's just dilapidated. Um, with the existing fence, in addition to putting the smooth top, uh, top rail um, on the top of the fence, um, what you might do is just make sure the wires are at appropriate height so that the dif difference between or the distance between the top rail and the second uh, wire is indeed 12 inches. You might want to make sure the bottom wire is at least 16 inches off the ground so a smaller animal could get underneath. And then if they were interested, another uh, improvement um, that they could do is to make this bottom wire a smooth wire. Just again so an animal doesn't catch itself as it, uh, as it tries to get underneath the wire. Um, but what we generally see, we, we do still consider fences wildlife friendly um, if they have barbed wire. Um, so that's just a common design is a smooth top, uh, a smooth bottom, and then you can maintain that barbed wire in the middle if you feel like that's better for containing your livestock, if they're less likely to rub up and destroy the fence if that barbed wire component still exists. Yeah. And what uh, sorts of animals will benefit from this project? Yeah, so the neighborhood we're in now is just like the last place, big elk movement corridor. So the landowner says that elk use this field all the time. They're coming through here. Um, one hasn't been trapped in this fence yet. Um, it's actually, they're doing a really nice job of keeping the, the wire really tight. So it's gonna be really hard for an animal to, to tangle itself in that. But I think these improvements are gonna make it even easier for the elk that use this area in the spring and fall uh, to move through this pasture. This is a big moose area as well, right? Yeah, we do have moose, so I don't know if you can see, but if you want to pan over, uh, we have willows here, which is pretty much what you're looking for when you're looking for prime moose habitat in the area. Um, willows are a food source, they're a uh, source of shade. There's actually running water down here, there's a little creek. So moose undoubtedly use this area too, and, and this would benefit moose as well. All right, everybody, thanks so much for watching today. We hope you enjoyed learning about wildlife friendlier fencing. Um, if you have any questions for us, please leave them in the comments. We'd be happy to answer those. Um, Kyle, what else can we do, people, we do, or people do that are interested in helping with wildlife from the earth fencing, maybe on their own properties or um, helping with a volunteer project um, at, with the foundation? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing is just to be more aware of barriers that exist to wildlife movement and migration on our landscape. We just don't think about that enough. And um, we have amazing resources available on our website. If you have property and you have a fence on your property, you want to get that modified or removed, and you're looking for innovative solutions that are for wildlife, uh, visit our website. We're at jhwildlife.org. We also rely on volunteers to do most of these removal product, uh, projects um, and donations. So if you want to support us, again, visit our website, jhwildlife.org, and there's a plethora of information available. Great. And you can also follow us uh, that's at JH Wildlife Foundation on, uh, on Instagram and Facebook, and also at Jackson Hole Eco Tours. Um, if you want to learn more about Eco Tour Adventures and what we do with wildlife tours in Grand Teton Yellowstone National Parks, visit www.jhecotouradventures.com. And thanks again for, for watching, and we uh, look forward to 